Good morning. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Psalms 90 says this here. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. It's nice that we have a God who's been there since the creation of the uh, world to now. He's been here in everything. Amen, huh? Again, happy Sabbath. Welcome to our church here. We're happy that you are worshiping with us here. It's a special Sabbath because uh, um, it's our uh, academy days. We've invited uh, students from around the conference to join uh, and be a part of our um, worship service here today and, and part of our academy this weekend. And so a special welcome to you. Thank you for uh, being here. At this time, I do have a couple of, of announcements here. Um, if you are interested in uh, joining us for choir, um, the next uh, choir rehearsal is uh, the 17th, the 8th, yes, the 8th, th so Thursday the 8th. Um, we're uh, doing a cantata for the Christmas program, the 20, no, December 22nd, I think it is. And uh, anyway, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's going to be a large choir. The students will be up here singing, the, uh, um, and then all the adults will be up here singing as well. It's going to be a great time. So really invite you, if you want to be a part of that, um, if you want to get email for the schedule, just uh, contact me or my wife, and we'll get the schedule out to you for choir rehearsals. Um, other than that, I don't think there's any other announcements unless somebody has one off the top of their head. At this time here, we'll invite Isaac Liss up here for the offering call. Good morning, church. How are you today? Good. <clears throat> so today's offering is for Montana Conference, and it is used for many things, including helping the school. Um, so would the deacons please come forward? Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you that we get to sing and enjoy your Sabbath with you. And I pray that we will have a great rest of the day. And I thank you for Sabbath and everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Samuel. At this time, we'd like to invite the children to come forward. It's time for a children's story. If you can come on up over here, uh, there, uh, there's some places here on the risers that you can sit. And as you come forward, um, uh, look for dollar bills and some money here to bring for our church. start how many of you guys like to play in the snow yeah me too all right do you guys know what skiing is yeah okay so I'm gonna tell you a story about when I started skiing I started skiing when I was in kindergarten so some of your guys' age um, so I was in fourth grade and I was one day our school decided they wanted to go on a ski trip so I was super excited because I, didn't, I haven't gone skiing in a while. So I was ready to go skiing again. So we got to the ski resort, and I was like, okay, I'll go on the baby hill a couple of times and get all warmed up, and then I'll go on the big hill, the big mountains. <laughs> so I, that's, I did as that. I went, on the baby, I went on the baby hill a couple of times. And then my friend... Uh, he was like, hey, do you want to go on the big mountain? I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. And I was like, I got this. I can do it. I'm ready to go. So we went on the ski lifts, and that takes us up the mountain. Um, so we got up on the mountain. I was like, okay, like this is going to be easy peasy lemon squeezy. I got this. I can do this. I was so sure that I will just make it down really fast. And so I... So we got off the ski uh, lifts, and um, when I got <laughs> when I got down the ramp, I I was going, and we we're getting ready to go down the mountain, and I fell. And at that time, the snow was re it was coming down really fast, um, and so it was really powdery, and I got stuck a lot. And at that time, I didn't really know how to control my skis, and so. Uh, my friend helped me up, and I dusted my ski, my ski off, and my boot off, and uh, I was like, "All right, no more falls. We're gonna, we're gonna go down this mountain." And so uh, we went down a little bit, and then I fell again, and I was like, "Oh no! Like, why do I keep falling?" And uh, my ski got stuck in the snow, and I couldn't get it out. So my friend had to help me again, and he had to, he was down a little bit, so he had to come up, take his skis off and go up and help me. And uh, so I dusted my ski off again and my boot. And I was like, OK, this is it. I'm not going to fall again. And so uh, we went down, and we started going really, really fast. And so the snow was really deep because all the powder and stuff. So um, I hit a bump, and then I tumbled down the mountain. And I did all sorts of kind of th things, and I twisted my ankle really bad. Um, and when I came to a stop, I was like, whoa, what happened? 
and I, so then my friend, he's like, oh no, are you okay? Like, are you hurt? And I was like, I twisted my ankle a little bit, or yeah, I twisted my ankle, and I don't know if I can make it down. She's like, I was like, or he was like, do you need some help? I was like, yeah, I don't know if I can get up and uh, start skiing again. So my friend went down the mountain to go get some help, or so I think he still got some help. I don't know if he just left me up there. And <laughs> so um, it was about 20 minutes, and I was just waiting for someone to come help me. And then I looked up the mountain, and I saw this kid and his father. And the kid was probably four years old. Are a couple of you four years old? Yeah, so he's about your age, four and a half, yeah. He was about your age, and he was just cruising down the mountain. And I was like, what? Like, this kid's over, like, he's a pro, and I'm just stuck down here. And I felt really embarrassed, and I was like, okay, like, why does this keep happening to me? I was putting myself down, and I was thinking really negative, negatively. And so I was like, all right, I think I should pray. So I said a prayer. I was like, dear God, please help me. You know, I really want to get down this mountain so I don't get, uh, so I can go home because I was really cold and my ankle really hurt. And I said my prayer and I was done. And I was like, okay. So I got up and I limped over to my ski because my ski fell off and it was over a couple, like five feet away. And I got my ski and I started slow, uh, going down the mountain very, very slowly. Um, and I made it down the mountain safely. Uh, but this story always reminds me that God's always there for me and uh, he'll never leave me and so whenever you're going through something hard just know that God's always there for you and when you pray he'll help you through the tough times because he loves you and he wants to see you succeed you may go back to your seats So today's scripture reading for today is Proverbs 3, 3, and 4. Um, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on a tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. All right, let's pray. Dear God, please hope today to be a really good day. Thank you that's the weekend. Thank you that we made it through the first quarter of school. And um, please be with our grades in the next week of school. And... um, Please help us to enjoy the weekend, and thank you that we have a Saturday. Jason, and pray. Amen.
first hymn today is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We're going to sing all of the verses. Please join us in singing. Come down, found up every blessing to my heart to sing the grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loud as grace. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still die in goodness prove. the hopes of endless glory fill my heart with joy and love. Ye are raised my Ebenezer in the fire. Oh, Lord of my heart. 
October is a special month. Um, uh, it's uh, Pastor Appreciation Month. And uh, <laughs> you may not have realized it here, but uh, um, we are so appreciative to have a pastor. Um, and I don't know a pastor who works harder than our pastor. He's got three churches, but really it's almost four churches because he, has, he goes over the, uh, the hill for Livingston, comes here for our church, goes over to the Bozeman Church, and he pastors our kids as well. That's a lot of work. He sits on many boards uh, for all three churches and also on the, the uh, school board, uh, MEE, and we're just so appreciative of everything you do for our church here. Um, we're really excited to give you a gift here. Um, to show our appreciation for you and Sandy and everything that you uh, mean to us. Thank you so much. Well, that is very, very much appreciated. Um, unnecessary. Uh, I feel that my reward is the privilege of getting to do what God has called me to do. And, and I have uh, come to appreciate greatly this church in the short time that I'm here and have been here. And uh, it's been a good thing as it has been in Livingston. I have a Michael's here and I'm assuming other family. Your wife's probably still home recovering from knee surgery. But he came over the hill from Livingston today just to see me preach evidently. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, very grateful. Yeah, I know his son is, is singing here, and um, I'm just looking at the risers here and figuring out where I'm going to go, but I have been banned from those from a very early age in my musical career, and so um, we'll just kind of find a home right here because I can see pretty much everyone from here. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, that is much appreciated and appreciate all of you greatly, even though in all reality in the process of, of this transition, I probably don't know some of you here, um, and you really don't know who I am, and we need to work on that as we, we move forward. We have one item of business to cover before I get started here, and that has to do with nominating committee. And this is always a, a fun time of the year, especially if you get to be on the committee. Um, right now, we get to have a first reading. Next week, we will vote this through. And um, if you haven't been called, you know right now that, unfortunately, you didn't make nominating committee. And the, your heart is probably broken, but we will see if we can get you through this. Um, the names on our list, uh, Larry King, Don Jones, Norm Susans, Russell Schaefer, Jason Rogers, with an alternate of Matt Lukens. And that is our first reading. Larry King, Don Jones, Norm Susans, Russell Schaefer, Jason Rogers, with an alternate of Matt Lukens. Interesting thing that I found as I was going through the calls people already knew that they were going to be on the nominating committee. Now, we hear a lot of things about collusion and underhanded things in our world today, and I don't know how much lower you can get than using those tactics to get on nominating committee, but uh, Norm and Russ both knew uh, ahead of time only because they were the deacons who collected the ballots and counted them, and, and I can assure you that they must be very, very honest men because if there was any temptation when you were counting the ballots, it would be to not count your name and let some other one have the privilege of being on nominating committee. So if nothing else, we have a very honest committee this year, and that's a good thing. We will do the second reading next week, and so that is that, and we are ready to get started with our time in God's Word today. And, and before I do that, a, a little bit remiss that this is kind of a special weekend on campus here because I'm thinking we have some young people here from various places around the state for Academy Days, and I know that you have already been welcomed from the time you got here um, because this is a welcoming place. But uh, one more time, we want to welcome you and thank you for being here and hope 
this experience this weekend will encourage you to make this weekend something more permanent in your, your school career down the road. So anyway, at this time, let's bow our heads and we will begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful to be here today, thankful that you have come to this place, uh, called us to be here with you, and Lord, as we open your word today, we would just ask that you would bless our time together here. Uh, Lord, may our hearts be open to the words you would speak to us today, God. May they be yours and your words only, Father, and we would ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Several years ago when my grandmother died, I inherited a lot of things from her, her Bible and some miscellaneous other things. Among those things I inherited was this little book. Um, I'm going to guess that this isn't familiar to most people here because this book comes all the way from 1931. And it is a book, and you can barely read the front cover, but it says autographs on the front. And it is an autograph book from Mount Alice Academy back in 1931 when my grandmother attended school here. And so I have a long history of Mount Alice Academy. You know, that's 87 years ago that she was here in school. And so I thought I'd bring this book today and just share a few of the things out of it. Um, my favorites is a page on the front here. Um, favorite study of my grandma back in 1931, biology. Isn't that amazing how faithful and dedicated Mr. Stewart has been? 87 <laughs> years. Still today, kids are saying biology at the top. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, I don't know if you guys have a school flower back in this day and age, but back then it was carnations and roses. Uh, the favorite sport of my grandmother was swimming and skating. Uh, we all know there used to be a skating rink down in the place where we camp people now during camp meeting. And on rainy days like today, they usually get stuck when they're trying to get out. So that is cool. Um, but Mr. Stewart evidently wasn't the only one that was having a major influence back in 1931 on our campus here. Uh, Matt Lukens if he's here today, uh, has to have some credit because back then in English, they must have been emphasizing poetry um, because this is basically the equivalent of what we would have as yearbooks today. And, and we would, you know, at the end of the year, you get to sign your autograph, your signature into a yearbook, and you usually add a few nice words. But they were really into poetry back then when they signed their yearbook. So I'm assuming... Poetry was an important thing. My grandmother's name, if you don't know it, you will figure it out quickly, was Gert or Gertrude. Um, I think I would go by Gert. Um, but anyway, dear Gert, may your life be long and happy. May your enemies be few. May your friends be just as many as the sparkling drops of dew. Let's see you guys remember that and sign that in your yearbook this year. That's pretty good, isn't it? I have to admit, I have some yearbooks at home, and some of the things in my yearbooks we couldn't read in church, but not the case in this autograph book. Uh, Dearest Gertrude, love many, trust few, but always paddle your own canoe. <laughs> Original poetry there. As I read that one, I was reminded of a poem I wrote when I was very small. Uh, it's in a Mother's Day card to my mom that I have in a scrapbook at home. And back then, creative poetry was right up my alley. Roses are red, violets are blue, they smell good, and so do you. Uh, that kind of has a canoe rhyme to it, and so that's good. Um, and we could read a lot more of these. Let's see here. Uh, this is the one, though. I want us to think about as we uh, get on to some important things from God's word today. Dearest Gertrude, when your life on earth is ended, now usually we don't start somebody's yearbook signing with those types of words. That, in your high school, that's not overly encouraging, but uh, hear it out because this is, this is good stuff. When your life on earth is ended and these paths no more you trod, may your name in gold be written in the autograph of God. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't sign a yearbook or an autograph book in that way, but could you actually sign anything better than that? May your name in gold be written in the autograph of who? Of God. To have a name that valuable that it could be written in gold in the autograph of God. Uh, is there a better wish to offer a classmate as you end a school year and go forward? Um, you know, and it's something that God, I think, desires for every one of us here today. And in the book of Proverbs, if you want to turn there with me in your Bible, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1, we are encouraged to shoot for what was written in that autograph book. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1. And it says there, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. New Living Translation says in place of a good name there to have a good reputation. But to have a good name, a good rep reputation, to be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Now, that phrase silver or gold really means that a good name is more valuable than all of the riches in this world. So if we want to have a name that is valued above all the riches of the world, what kind of a name does it say we must have? It says we must have a good name. Webster's Dictionary gives this definition for autograph. It is simply a handwritten signature. And I suppose that's a good definition for an autograph, but it seems to be missing something. Because an autograph really has value because of the name that is written there, doesn't it? And in the way that we use autograph today, there is usually value because that person has some kind of meaning to us. Maybe they're a famous athlete or a famous musician or someone along those lines, but there's something that we know about the person when we see their name, when we see their handwritten signature. And God is saying here that there is something when they see our name that he desires of us. When people look at our name, when they look at our autograph, God is desirous that they see what? They see good. And in our scripture reading today, there is a list of two words, just a very short list, that points us to how we can have a good name. Now, I know scripture reading has often become in church something that almost is just part of what we do for the church service. But I hope that it's more than that. I hope that we're listening to what it says. Because if you listen to scripture this morning, there were two words that it says can give us a good name. Now, I don't know what reward I would give, but does anybody remember those two words without looking up the scripture reading very quickly? See, now I've told my church families in other places that you know, if you do this, then why do we have a scripture reading? Is it really just to fill in a segment of the time? I can preach for that much longer easily, so we really wouldn't need it. But we're going to go back today um, to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And there are two things here listed that Solomon gives us, God gives us through Solomon, that he tells us will provide for us a good name. Proverbs 3, verses 3 and 4, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you'll win favor and a good what? A good name. So those two things. Now, if you have the King James Version, it says there, mercy and truth instead of love and faithfulness. Um, but really, mercy, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, mercy is really nothing more than putting hands and feet on love. 
Love is just a word unless it has something behind it. It's easy to say I love someone, uh, but maybe not so easy for them to know it by our what? Our actions. Mercy is love in action. And faithfulness here is actually the word that truth represents. So let love or mercy and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. In other words, you know right where they are. Write them on the tablet of your heart, and then you will be known as one who has a what? A good name. A good name comes with love and faithfulness. I don't know about you, but as I read this, and I know that God is desirous of me having a good name, then I want those attributes to be part of my life. But there is a problem in and of my own self. Our love and faithfulness, natural attributes for Pastor Jim. They're not for me, and I'm not alone, because none of us come by those things naturally. Those are something that come only by the grace of God. A matter of fact, if we were to look at God and look at his character in Scripture, God is known as love. God is love. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. I am faithfulness. Those are attributes of whose name? That's God's name. And so when it says here that we bind them around our neck, we have them written on our heart, we literally are talking about writing the character of God or Jesus upon our what? Upon our hearts. To have a good name is asking God to put his character, the character of Jesus, right here in our lives. And as we do that, then we become one who is known as having a good what? A good name. But it is God who adds that value to our name, isn't it? And when it comes to autographs, that's really the case. It's baseball season, the World Series is on. Uh, my Dodgers, up until last night, evidently, I've heard that they have. Uh, made the gap a little narrower. We're down two to zero to the Red Sox, but now it's two to one. Evidently, 18 innings last night would have been a great game to watch if you wanted to stay up till three in the morning. Um, but baseball, a simple baseball. You know how much an average baseball costs in Major League Baseball today? Well, we're going to have to do some math because as I did research, you could only figure it out by how much a team pays for a dozen of the baseballs, and so baseballs cost $72 a dozen. 72 divided by 12 is 6, so the average baseball in Major League Baseball today is worth $6. And if we were to go back to the early 1900s, that baseball would probably cost a dollar or two at best. Things have inflated price-wise. So really, in the scope of value, a baseball in and of itself is really not of that much value. But back in the early 1900s, a man by the name of Babe Ruth signed just an average baseball that was used in the major leagues. Back then, something worth maybe a buck or two, but he wrote his name on it. Is there value in Babe Ruth's name? There is a whole lot of value in Babe Ruth's name because that baseball today is worth $388,000. One baseball, six bucks for us today, worth $388,000. If you have one of those laying around in your closet and you thought it didn't really mean a whole lot, it means something, you better go find it, right? I would love to have one of those sitting in my closet. But what made that baseball so valuable? It was the name that was put on it. You know, in and of myself, I am really nothing more than ordinary. But you write the name of Jesus on my heart. What does that do to my life? What does that do to my name? Does it add value to have the name of Jesus written across my heart? That's what Solomon's telling us. 
a good name that is valuable, more valuable than anything else in this world, is a name that reflects who? Jesus Christ. It is a life that has the name of Jesus autographed across it. What a beautiful picture of what God is calling us to be. And we all know we need the name of Jesus in our lives because in and of ourselves, we are no different than an ordinary baseball. But with Jesus, we become valuable because we're valuable to who? We're valuable to Jesus. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 1, because we're going to take this a little bit further, uh, remembering again those two words that give us a good name, our love and what? Faithfulness. So... Proverbs 16 and verse 6 in your Bible, just a few pages away, through love and faithfulness. So we're talking about what? The very things that give us a good name here. It says, through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, a man avoids evil. Now that is a powerful verse if you stop and think about it. It says, through love and faithfulness, sin is what? atoned for, atonement, covered. Now, do the good things that I do in my life get rid of sin, make atonement? Does doing good take away my sin? Well, I think all of us know from Scripture there's only one thing that takes away sin in my life, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's it. So what is Solomon saying here? Solomon is saying that when the character of God is written on your heart, when the name of Jesus, the autograph of Jesus is on our hearts, our sin is what? It's atoned for. The name of Jesus is where our salvation is. The name of Jesus is where our atonement is. And though I may not have a name that could be considered a good name in and of myself, when the name of Jesus is on me, how does God view me? As if I had never, what? As if I had never sinned. What does that do to my name? Does that make it of greater value than if I stand without Jesus? It certainly does, doesn't it? And so God is calling us to this good name. God is calling us to have the name of Jesus written on our hearts. God is calling us to live a life in which the, the name of Jesus is projected from our lives because understand that it's a good thing to talk about all of these things, but still it's a choice that I have to make to do what? To live it. I can say Jesus' name is written on my heart, but do I have to live that way? It's a choice, isn't it? It's a choice to allow Jesus to be here, but it's also a choice I have to make to live like I really have Jesus here. And there's a verse that I want to take us to now in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 1 that brings this close to home for me at least because this whole aspect of what Jesus does for us is a wonderful thing but understanding that and living it are two different things. It's nice to know that we're forgiven. It's nice to know that Jesus' name on our hearts does some things to us. But how do we live our lives? Jesus once told the Pharisees or told his disciples about the Pharisees, we find it in Matthew, um, that the things they talk about and ask that you should do, you need to do them, but don't live like them because they don't practice what they preach. See, I can be up here all day long preaching to you about having the name of Jesus written on my heart and on our hearts. But if I don't go out and make an effort to live that, does it really mean anything? Doesn't mean a thing, does it? And notice what it tells us here in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 1. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly or foolishness outweighs wisdom and honor. And that word honor there is the one we want to focus on because that word honor literally means the same thing as having a good what? A good name. And it says here that just as a dead fly gives beautiful smelling perfume a bad smell, 
so foolishness can do what to our name? It can take what is good and make it not so good. It can give it a bad smell, so to speak. I was probably 10 years old at the time, and at that age, I still like sports, uh, but at that age, I was over the top, especially with basketball and the Montana Grizzly basketball team in Missoula. Now, I know that may be heresy within these walls, but... I don't know what's happened over the last 20 some games the cats have won one so I think I'm on solid ground up here um, but there was there was a player by the name of Michael Ray Richardson and he was good so good that this young 10 year old boy idolized everything he did I had white t-shirts that had Montana Grizzlies written across it in big marker and the number of him and his name on the back and I would pretend to be him and and this one particular year uh, their schedule for their games came out on these great big posters and they had the different players from the Grizzlies on there and the one I wanted more than anything else was to have Michael Ray Richardson's poster but there were very few of them and it didn't seem to matter how hard I tried to get one there was always other kids in line in front of me that got it but I remember one game I got to the table and there was one of them left I had my prized possession but now to top it off I needed to get his autograph on that poster so after the game, I went to the locker room door, and nobody was coming out very quickly. And so while security was looking the other way, I slipped into the locker room, went up the stairs, and joined newspaper reporters and TV reporters and a bunch of the U of M basketball players walking around in nothing more than a towel in the locker room. There were people that were looking at me like, what are you doing here? But I had my poster and a pen in hand, and I was on a mission. And so I got behind the newspaper reporter that was speaking to Michael Ray Richardson. And when the reporter was done, I held out my pen and poster and said, could you please sign this? And all the way across the front of that poster in the biggest signature you can imagine, he wrote his name. And it was very legible, Michael Ray Richardson. And I didn't even need to think about walking back to my parents because I was just floating. I had something that was so valuable. Before I went to bed that night, it had this place on the wall of my bedroom. Above all other things was this poster. A couple of years later, he was drafted into the NBA. First round pick. All-star, rookie of the year. He had a career and a half ahead of him. His second year in the lead, league, I believe, I will never, ever forget this as a young boy opening up the Missoulian paper to the sports section. And the headline in big, bold, black letters across the top of the sports page was Michael Ray Richardson had been suspended for the rest of the year for using cocaine. My heart sunk. That was my hero. And even as a young boy, I knew what he had done was not a good thing. And I looked at that poster on the wall, and it was like, what should I do with that poster? Because all of a sudden, that name meant a whole lot less, didn't it? But I left it there because it was one mistake, and he would turn it around. He would come back. He would still be this hero of mine and he did come back the next year and he was doing great and I remember opening the paper on another day and reading the very same headline again but this time he had been banned for life from the NBA never again would he play basketball the thing that he was better than most everyone else at doing it was all gone Warren Buffett says that it takes 20 years to build a good reputation and just five minutes 
to ruin it. 20 years to build a good reputation, just five minutes to ruin it. That poster came down off the wall and ended up in a stack of other stuff on the floor. That name that had once meant so much really meant nothing to me anymore. To even think about it just broke this young boy's heart because that was my hero. Warren Buffett goes on to say, 20 years to build a good reputation, five minutes to ruin it. Therefore, in every decision we make, we should think about that. When we are making decisions, ones perhaps where we know there is some question to it especially, stop and think about, he says, the consequences of what you're about to do. Because God has called you to what kind of a name? And what God has been doing in your heart, what God has been working on in your heart, what God has been making you is the work of a lifetime. But you know what? Sometimes it only takes one decision, one little five-minute thing to take what God has created and made good to do what? To tear it apart. And we all know here today when those things happen in our lives, for the Michael Ray Richardsons of the world, is God's forgiveness big enough for what he did? It's big enough for my five minutes when I have taken what God has put together and torn it apart, isn't it? We're not talking about our salvation here. We're not talking about God as a God who looks down and it's one mistake and you're out. We're talking about a God who is always willing to what? Forgive. Always willing to rebuild what we have torn apart. And yet understanding what God desires of us and how valuable that is to us. As we make our choices in life, doesn't it make sense that we should take time to value the name that God has given us, to value the autograph that we have in Christ Jesus and make it worth something each and every day in the decisions that we make. There's a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12 that is an amazing verse when we stop and think about it here. Think about what God is calling us to. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. And it says this, Live such good lives among even the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify who? Glorify God, glorify the Father. May it be in my life that I live my life in such a way that my autograph, that my name is such that even those who are trying to find something wrong with my life, trying to tear down who I am, can find no wrong but can only do what when it's all said and done? Glorify God. You see, this name that God is calling to isn't to our glory. God doesn't want Pastor Jim to have a good name so he can sit up here and say, look at me. God wants my name to be good because it's his name that's on my heart. God wants my name to be good because it reflects on who God is. And it's an opportunity in our lives to show the world who God is. And in a world today that needs to know who Jesus is, is there a better thing to stop and think that Jesus can write his name in my heart? And that same name can be what people see in me. And in the end, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. What is our autograph today? How are we known? There's one other verse that I want to read today, and, and this verse is really in particular for Mount Ellis Academy and for our young people here. First Peter, or First Timothy, rather, First Timothy chapter four and verse 12. Paul is speaking to Timothy, and notice what he says here. And again, remember those words that Solomon used back in Proverbs, love and what? Faithfulness. He says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are what? Because you are young. But set an example. 
Don't let anybody look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, and in love and faith. The very things that God puts upon our heart, the very name of who Jesus is that is in our life, he's telling Timothy here, don't worry because you're young. Be a good example to who? To the believers. Let them see the name of Jesus in your life. And I want to tell you today that the name of Jesus, the autograph of Mount Ellis Academy is in good hands with our young people here. I had an opportunity to mention this in my other churches last Sabbath, um, and I want to share it with you today. We had the Amen Clinic come to town last weekend, and these students were a part of the Amen Clinic. And when I look out and I see the faces of these students here today and, and I can, in my mind, see them doing the various things that they were doing inside the fairgrounds buildings just a week ago yesterday and tomorrow, they were doing just what Paul called them to do. They were showing the autograph of Jesus, the name of Jesus in their lives. And, and I know even around this conference at times, there have been those who have had opportunity to say some things about the academy and the students that give the picture that maybe our kids aren't quite where they need to be. But you know what? They need to come here and spend some time and see who our kids really are. They need to be at places like the fairgrounds last week to see the youth that Paul is talking about, showing adult believers the name of Jesus. Whether it's a young student offering an arm to an older lady to escort them from one side of the fairgrounds to the other, or students handing out snacks, the water and the fig bars to people, or students that were running back and forth cleaning dental instruments and getting them put back in the right boxes so when the dentist came to the next patient, they would be set to go. All of those things that were happening there were our young people showing our community what our autograph is. And our autograph is who? It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. I spent some time on the phone yesterday with a woman who spent some time with one of our students here on this campus who is going to be starting next Thursday doing Bible studies. That's an awesome thing. That is one of our young people here, God's young people doing what God has called us to do. And you know what our sermon title day, this is our autograph. You know what at Mount Ellis Academy, Mount Ellis Academy Church, I believe with all of my heart that this has to be the goal that we have above all else is that our autograph is Jesus Christ. That as people look at us, they will see one thing and that is who Jesus is. Our young people are no different than I was when I was their age. Sometimes there's a little dead fly in the perfume, isn't there? But you know what? The Bible says the love and the faithfulness of Jesus lived out in our lives as we saw it demonstrated last weekend covers all of that, doesn't it? We all make mistakes. We all have our shortcomings. But in Christ Jesus, our name can be one that is valued above all other things, more than all of the riches of the world. And to close today, remembering that writing, that little poem from the autograph book from 1931, um, may our name be written in what? In gold, in whose autograph? 
in God's book. There are some neat promises, the message, messages to the seven churches, which, by the way, uh, this isn't about when Jesus comes. This is talking about our church today. It's talking about the church through the ages and for those who overcome. Uh, Revelation 3 and verse 12. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. That's Jesus speaking. And that's not talking about whenever Jesus comes. That's going to be a glorious day, but that's talking about right now. When does God want us to overcome? Does he want us to wait till he comes again and then say, okay, Jesus, I'm yours now. Write your name on my heart. Or does he want that process to be happening right now today? You know what? We're overcomers in Christ Jesus today. We have the name of Jesus written on our hearts today. And it says here that this is something that is more valuable than anything else, that God is going to write the name of himself, of Jesus Christ on our hearts. And then this one in closing, uh, chapter 3 and verse 5. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will never blot his name written in gold in my autograph book. It will never be blotted out. But I will acknowledge his name before my Father and the angels. To the glory of God. What is your autograph today? What is our autograph? Is Jesus taking it before the Father today? Is he acknowledging my name before God today and before the angels and before the universe? That is a name that is to be valued above all the riches of the world. It's a name to be valued because it's the name of Jesus that is written on my heart. A name that is worth signing. A name that will stand forever in God's autograph book. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity. Lord, as ordinary as we are, just as simple as a, a little baseball, Lord, can have great value because of a name on it. And Lord, um, we all acknowledge before you today that in and of ourselves, uh, the only value that is really there is what you see in us, what you came and died for. But Father, it can become so much more. Your name is written on our hearts. The autograph of Jesus, the name that is seen in us, will be to the glory of God. Lord, may it be so today. Lord, we invite you to come and, and write your name, the name of Jesus Christ, on our hearts, that the world might see you, that we might be an example, not only to believers, but to the world around us. This is our autograph today, Lord. This is our Jesus, and we pray these things in his name. Amen.
Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, your name, the name that covers all of who we are. Inscribe that name on our hearts, and as we go out into the community this week here, may the only person they see is you. Thank you for your love. Amen. At this time, we'd like to invite you to be part of our Sabbath schools. We have a Sabbath school over here in the library. The uh, Academy has a Sabbath school over here in the IA building, and we uh, would love for you to join us. Thank you so much.